I am Dr. Mina Aliyam. I'm coming to you from New York. I am a few minutes down from the United Nations and I speak to you from that great organization. Um, I am a naturopathic doctor that just recently retired from medicine um, to establish the Federation of International Gender and Human Rights. In my 30 years of medical practice, I was able to and amass a great wealth of education, knowledge, information, and of course, substantive information that would be able to be transferred and translated into a few languages and things that I really appreciate that the youth are picking up and some of the things we're going to be talking about today. I want to thank you for inviting me and I want to thank all that are listening. Uh, I pray that this is a great show. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All right. Now, uh, can you give us a sort of a small background of the diaspora community where you live? You live in New York. Can you tell us about the community there so that we can sort of start from there, please? Okay. Well, the community is um, quite large. As you know, there's a reason why they put the United Nations here in, the United, in New York. Because in the state of New York, especially in this region that we're in, we literally have a community representative from every country, every tribe, and every community in the globe, right here in New York. So we have at least one person from Nigeria, from Senegal, from Mauritania, from any country you can name, any community, any tribe you have in this world is represented right here in New York. So it makes sense that the, the New York area become the headquarters for the, the United Nations. Now in speaking with that, that was a strategy. And they did that strategy in the 60s because even then there was a representation of the countries here. So knowing that, I, I give that as my opening strategy always. And I tell that story because I want everyone to understand that the United Nations is a sovereign community that is built up of many, many voices. And it's intentional. It is directed. It is motivational, if nothing else. And it, it empowered me to retire to serve that community. So to answer your question more directly, I serve the greater community regardless of the voice that is spoken and it's intentional. So when I go into speaking arenas and I go into certain demographics, whether it be student, whether it be adult, whether it be women, whether it be men, I always bring the united front of the many voices so that we will collectively offer solutions, resolutions and, and make this community a little bit better. All right, that is absolutely important. And you have also served uh, in the military, which means that you have also uh, have that kind of experience, no? Yes. Uh, now, uh, you, are, you are still serving now, even though you are not in the military, you are serving in a different uh, branch. So what I'm trying to get at here is, how did you develop this your, this your passion? Because once you are serving in the military, you are out of it, you are still serving, you are still uh, fully engaged with the community. So can you share with that with us? Of course. Um, I was in obstetrics and gynecology, which if anyone knows, it deals with mommies having babies um, and the families that are surrounding this new life that's coming through. And in developing that reputation and developing the rapport with women, I came across a need to educate. I noticed that so many women were coming in asking more questions than they were needing medical help. 99% of the things that I gave to my mommies had nothing to do with the physical. It had to do with the mental. So what I'm noticing is that things that they were unsure of, things that they didn't, uh, they didn't know before they got pregnant, different things that are not taught in the tribe, in the community, or in the culture of the people, certain things that are alienated or, or seen as not necessary for the woman to know, yet she has to deal with it in pregnancy, in marriage, in growing up. So this was one of the things that I saw happening in the community and decided that I'm going to give more education and knowledge than I am medical care. I think that the medical care will happen and we will see the, the pitfalls and the pros and cons and, and factor it in accordingly. But I think the education piece, the thing that most people take for granted when they're having a baby or when they're starting a family or even when they're getting married, they, they don't realize is a great factor. So education became that first passion. And then women, of course, is the ultimate passion. I'm a woman. I've always been a woman. I have uh, five daughters, so I raise women. So I was always curious about how to be a better woman. So the education, the experience, the wisdom, the knowledge all came into being, into helping me to better be a great woman. 
And that, of course, trickles down into anything that I do in any way that I am. So I'm praying that that will be the, the true acumen of my passion and what is seen in my work. All right. Fantastic. That is really very important. Of course, education is everything. It's important that we have it. Without it, we are going nowhere. It's like the light. It's like uh, the key to open all the doors. All right. Now, uh, it's true that what we are talking about is uh, connection, is the diaspora connection. Uh, but I'm still going to ask you anyway. Uh, why do you think this connection is very important today among the Africans in diaspora, which of course we are looking at Africans that are maybe in Europe, uh, those that are in uh, in US, in the US area, in America, those are uh, also in other parts of the world. Why do you think it is important today that we should connect more with ourselves? Correct. Um, that's a great question. You know, I'm going to take you back uh, on a history lesson really quick. Um, the transatlantic slave trade, this is when we were our most connected and then our most disconnected. Um, when we, when those that of us that came over to the US came over through the transatlantic slave trade, um, I was one of those, those people, my great, two greats, great, great grandmother came over under that guise from the Senegambia region and she set up site here in the United States. Now she didn't speak the language. She didn't understand the culture of the people. And all she knew is that she wanted to get back to what was comfortable. Um, and in knowing that, a lot of the language, the custom, the tradition, the religion even was lost. Um, my great grandmother was Christian and my grandmother was Christian. Um, but knowing that when we came over here, we were Muslim and we lost that. And we want to say that that's the new way to be. We want to say that that's a spiritual connection. No, it was beat into us and it was told that we are to be Christian because being Muslim was foreign to the people that brought us here and they didn't understand it. They thought it was witchcraft and voodoo and they thought it was bad and, and demonic. So they didn't want us doing it. So they wanted us to transition to Christianity. Well, there was a part of me that understood that and read that and realized that that was what we needed to get back to. So in trying to break that, that generational curse, I brought the Islam back into the family. And now the family is uh, Muslim again. Um, and knowing that that small story about disconnect has happened regionally, globally. We have lost who we are as a people. We have lost the connection that we had to who we were, what we were back in the day, to now what we accept and what we believe in our culture and our tradition. And that has caused a rift between those born in the African continent and those born in the United States to the point where there are certain African communities that will not ass assimilate with the Western mindset. They won't, they don't believe we're real, we're true Africans. They don't believe that we are the right uh, brand of people to emulate. They don't even believe our Islam is the true Islam. They want to believe that we are so far apart from them that the only thing we have in color in common is our color. Um, and that's unfortunate because you know we are a reflection of each other. I am Gambian. I am I am from the lineage of the Fulani people of the of the, the excuse me the Griot people of the Fulani tribe, and I am Gambian. So whether I was born in Brooklyn, New York, or whether I was born in Kotu, I am still Gambian, and that is in my blood. So for me, being disconnected from those that look like me that were born in the motherland is is hurtful, because I'm never seen as this true. Uh, African. I'm seen as African American, and I'm labeled that. It was. It's almost like it's punched into my birth certificate, and it's it's unfortunate because what it is that I hold is the next lineage of the people that are here that are in the continent. It's unfortunate we couldn't go back. It's unfortunate we couldn't continue. But now is the time that the children need to understand that the diaspora and the continent should be one. We should be learning from each other. We should be contributing to each other, and most importantly our strategic planning for each other should be inclusive. This is where diversity, equity, and inclusion should be its greatest within our own people. And if we don't get back to that and we don't adhere to that, we will be a lost people and we will always be divided. <music>